In this video, we will talk about differentiation. We will start by deriving what the derivative of a function at a point C is equal to, and this is the definition right here. Uh, this is not related so much to differentiation. This is algebra, but this formula, the difference of squares and difference of cubes and generalizations of this formula has proven useful. We will also look at sequences and how we can use sequences to determine if a function is differentiable at a point C. And then we'll also look at the relationship between continuity, continuity and differentiability. In particular, if something is differentiable, then it is continuous. The converse is not necessarily true. We'll look at rules for derivatives of some products and quotients. Thankfully, they're very uh, what you would expect them to be. And then we'll look at the chain rule, which is exactly the same chain rule you learned in first year calculus. We will start with the definition of the derivative. Let f be a real valued function defined on an interval i containing the point c. The point c may be an endpoint of i. We say that f is differentiable at c or has a derivative at c if the following limit exists and is finite. So the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c all divided by x minus c. And we denote the derivative of f at c by f prime of c and again the limit of f of x minus f of c all over x minus c. If a function f is differentiable at each point of the set s, which is a subset of our interval i, then f is said to be differentiable on s. And the function f prime s to r is called the derivative of f on s. Our first example, left f of x equals x squared for each real number x. Then for any real number c, we have f prime of c using our definition is equal to the limit as x approaches c of f of x minus f of c all over x minus c. So that's the limit and plugging this in, uh, our f of x is x squared, our f of c is c squared divided by x minus c. Factoring x squared minus c squared as a difference of two squares, we can then cancel our x minus c and then plugging in as x approaches c we see that our limit so plugging in c for x is equal to 2c. Finally, we say our derivative f prime of x, since c is any real number, is equal to 2x for all x in the real numbers. And geometrically, the quotient f of x minus f of c over x minus c represents the slope of the secant line through the points c f of c and x f of x. So here we have uh, a random point x and a random point c, if we have f of c here and f of x over here, then f of x minus f of c is the uh, rise, and the uh, x minus c is the run. So this is the change in the y direction of f of x minus f of c over the change in the x direction. So that gives us a slope, f of x minus f of c over x minus c uh, gives us this kind of approximation, the secant line or the slope. And if you recall, as c gets uh, closer to x, then our secant line becomes exactly the tangent line at our function. So for example, if f of x equals x squared when c is equal to 1 half and x equals 2, we can find our secant line as f of 2 minus f of 1 half over 2 minus 1 half is equal to 5 halves. So looking at this, we have our f of 1 half is here. Our f of 2 is over here. So this blue line is the secant line, the rise over run, and it is equal to the slope is 5 halves, whereas this tangent line slope at this point, 1 half, is equal to 1. As I said, as in the limit as c gets closer to x, the secant line slope will get closer to the tangent slope. Next, we'll look at the sequential criterion for limits. It's useful when trying to show that a given function is not differentiable at a particular point. So the theorem, let i be an interval containing the point c, and suppose that f goes from i to r, then f is differentiable at c if and only if every sequence xn and i that converges to c, with xn not equal to c, the sequence f of xn minus fc over xn minus c converges. 
Furthermore, if it's differentiable at C, then the sequence of the quotients, this here, will converge to F prime of C. We will do a couple of examples to see what this theorem is saying. So let f of x equal to the absolute value of x for each real number, and let x of n equal uh, uh, negative 1 to the n over n for all the natural numbers. So here is our sequence. So the sequence x of n converges to 0 at 0. So let's take a look. So we have n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. x of n is equal to negative 1 to the n over n. So for n equals 1, we get negative 1. For n equals 2, so this becomes positive, we get 1 half. For n equals 3, we have the negative 1 third. For n equals 4, we get 1 fourth. Next, we should look at our sequence here of quotients, f of xn minus f of c over xn minus c. So I've written that formula here. In this formula, f of xn is equal to the absolute value of x. f of c, well, c is equal to 0, because we're looking at convergence at 0. So f of 0 is just equal to 0. Then I have x, which is my x of n minus 0. Plugging in for n equals 1, we have x of n is equal to negative 1. The absolute value is just 1 over uh, x of n, which is negative 1. So we get negative 1. For n equals 2, we have the absolute value of 1 half, which is just 1 half, divided by 1 half, which is 1. And for n equals 3, now we're going to have the top is an absolute values, the bottom is not, so we get negative 1. And then 4, the top and the bottom are equal, so we get 1. So you can see our function is bouncing around between negative 1 and 1. So this, since this sequence here does not converge by this theorem that talks about the interval, then f is not differentiable at x equals 0, even though it is continuous. And I have the plot here, you can see. Even though the function is continuous, it is not convergent by this theorem here. We will look at the example of f of x equals absolute value of x one more time, but this time using, instead of this theorem, we'll be using the definition of the derivative. I've rewritten my f of x uh, in this form here. So if c is greater than 0, so we're over here, then the derivative of c by our definition is equal to the absolute value of x minus absolute value of c over x minus c. And since here c is greater than 0, and as x approaches c, we'll assume that x is greater than 0. So we'll get the limit as x approaches c of x minus c over x minus c, which is equal to 1. Similarly, we can consider c less than 0. So the derivative is equal to the limit of absolute value of x minus absolute value of c over x minus c. And since c is less than 0, as x approaches c, we'll assume s x is also less than 0. So what we have for absolute value of x is negative x minus, and for the absolute value of c, we get minus c over x minus c. So algebraically, this will be equal to negative 1. And so far, so good. f of x is differentiable for c greater than 0 and c less than 0. Last, we will consider c equals 0. But f of x is not differentiable at x equals 0. To see why, when we set c equal to 0, f prime of c is equal to the limit as x approaches our value of c. Absolute value of x minus 0, x minus 0, which is the limit as x approaches 0 of absolute value of x over x. So first we should consider what happens when we approach x from the positive side. In this case, our x is positive and our limit is equal to 1. But when we approach 0 from the negative side, our x is negative, so our limit is equal to negative 1. And since these two limits do not agree, so the limits from the positive and negative direction do not equal, f of x is not differentiable at x equals 0. It's differentiable everywhere else. For our next example, we're going to look at f of x is equal to 3x squared plus 1 if x is less than 1, and f of x is equal to 2x cubed plus 2 if x is greater than 1. So I've written it out in this kind of form. And we want to know if f is differentiable at x equals 1. And one thing to note, in both equations, f of 1 is equal to 4. When we plug in 1 into this equation, we get 4, and in this equation, we get 4. So that's a good thing as far as... Um, being differentiable is. So the next thing is to consider the one-sided limits for the derivative at x equals 1. 
To that end, we are going to look at the limit as x approaches 1 from the left-hand side. So sort of like from the negative going up to x equals 1. So the negative reminds me that it's negative sort of from the left. So we'll look at the limit of f of x minus f of c. In this case, c is equal to 1, x minus c. Our function, as we approach 1 from the left, that is when x is less than 1, is 3x squared plus 1. So we plug that in for f of x, and then we do the uh, limit, and we get 3 times 2, which is 6. Now looking at the limit as x approaches 1 from the right, that is from values larger than or equal to 1, that's um, our f of x is 2x squared plus 2. Our f of 1 is still equal to 4. So we do our simplification algebraically, we plug in our 1, and we get 6. Since the limits agree, the two limits from the left and right agree, we conclude that f prime of 1 exists, and it is equal to 6. And again, for a limit to exist, it has to be the same when you approach from any direction. And on the real line, you approach from the left or from the right. Our next problem is to consider the function f of x equals x times sine of 1 over x if x does not equal to 0. And then x, um, f of 0 is defined to be 0. Determine if f is differentiable at x equals 0. Here, as x approaches 0, the limit of sine of 1 over x does not exist. Remember, for to be differentiable, we have to have this limit to exist. So therefore, f is not differentiable at x equals 0. Our next topic is continuity and differentiability. So it is possible for a function to be continuous at a point without being differentiable. On the other hand, if f is differentiable at a point, then it must be continuous. So in other words, differentiable implies continuous, but not the other way around. And our theorem is, if we have a function f from i to r that is differentiable at a point c and i, then f is continuous at c. Again, differentiable implies continuous. For the proof, we will start with the definition of what it is for f to be differentiable. So since f prime of c exists, we know that the limit, taking this here, of f of x minus f of c, x over c, is equal to f prime of c, which is a real number. And with x not equal to c, we can rewrite f of x. So we can multiply the whole expression by x minus c to get rid of the uh, denominator. And then we can add f of c. And then what we're left with is f of x. Using our properties of limits, we can write the limit as x approaches c of f of x now is the limit of x minus c times the limit of f of x minus f of c over c plus the limit of f of c. As x approaches c, this limit here becomes 0, and we multiply it times f prime of c, but 0 times f prime of c is 0, and then this limit becomes f of c. So what we have is the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. And from our theorem from a previous video where we discussed continuity and how continuity related to accumulation points, we said that if c is an accumulation point of d, then f of c is continuous at c is equivalent to f has a limit at c and limit of x as, as x approaches c of f of x is equal to c. So this fact here, this limit as x approaches c, f of x is equal to f of c, is equivalent to f is continuous at c. So again, by this theorem here, this implies that f, this, this line, and this theorem implies that f is continuous at c. Next, we have our rules for derivatives of sums, products, and quotients. So suppose we have f going from i to r and g going from i to r, and both are differentiable at the point c. Let k be a real number. Then the function k times f is differentiable at c, and the derivative of kf at c is equal to k times f prime of c. And the function f plus g is also differentiable at c, and f plus g prime at c is equal to f prime of c plus g prime of c. And the product rule, it's the same, but all of these are actually the same from first year calculus. f g prime of c, remember we have to take f of c times the derivative of g prime of c plus f prime of c times 
g of c. And the quotient rule, if g of c is not equal to zero, then the function f over g is differentiable, and then we can uh, have this formula here, where it's g of c times f prime of c minus f of c, g prime of c over g of c squared. These rules should look really familiar to you, and now what we want to do is get familiar with their proofs. We will prove the product rule, and we will start by just looking at the def definition of the derivative. So f times g prime of c is equal to the limit as x approaches c of f of x, which is f times g of x, minus f of c, which is f times g of c, all over x minus c. And we want to show this expression for the derivative that we got from the definition is equal to what we're claiming in our theorem, f of c times g prime of c plus f prime of c times g of c. And we can start by plugging in our g prime of c and our f prime of c. So we have f of c times g prime of c, and this is just g of x minus g of c over x minus c by the definition of g prime of c. And then we can plug in our definition of f prime of c, which is f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Now we want to show that this is equal to this. So we're going to work on this side a little bit, and we're just going to separate our f and g. Do it because they're just functions. We can separate that to f of x times g of x minus f of c times g of c. When I compare this to what I want over here, you can see that here I have f of c times g of x, and I don't have anything that looks like this. In other words, I don't have anything where the variable is c times something with the variable is x. So I need to add some terms that look like f of c and g of x. Of course, if I add this f of c and g of x, I also have to subtract it. So this is the same here. I have my f of x, g of x. I have my minus f of c, g of c. But here I added and then subtracted f of c g of x. And again, I did that because I wanted to get something that looked more like this term because I'm trying to show that these two are equal. And again, trying to make this look, this look more like this, I'm going to factor my, out my f of c. So here I factored out my f of c, and you can see I have something, no pun intended, I have something that now looks like my first term. And then I have this other stuff here that I really want to look like the second term. And now from this term here, I can pull out g of x, and then I'm left with f of x minus f of c over x minus c. Since f is continuous at c and also g is continuous at c, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to f of c. So what I have here is f of c times g prime of c plus g of c times f prime of c, which is exactly what I wanted to show. I wanted to show that this expression, f times g prime of c, is equal to f of c times g prime of c plus g of c times f prime of c. For our next example, we're going to prove that if f of x is equal to x to the n, then the derivative of f of x is equal to n times x to the n minus 1. Next, we are going to use a generalization of this formula, which is the difference of squares here and the difference of cubes here. And for whatever reason, when you talk about differentiation, these two formulas come in really handy. And so the generalization here is this x to the n minus c to the n. We can pull out x minus c, and then we're going to have x to the n minus 1 plus c times x to the n minus 2. We keep incrementing the exponent on c while decrementing the exponent on x to the n until finally we get c to the n minus 2, x plus c to the n minus 1. So there's this kind of uh, parallel balanced increasing one exponent while decreasing the other. Here we have algebraic manipulation until we finally get that the derivative of f at c is equal to n times c to the n minus 1. So f is differentiable at all c in the real numbers and the derivative is equal to n times x to the n minus 1. 
In our next example, we are again going to look at f of x equals x to the n, but we are going to consider the case when n is a negative integer. So note that if n is a negative integer, then minus n is positive. And then if g is equal to x to the minus n, then f of x here is equal to 1 over g. We will use the fact that if f of x equals x to the n, then the derivative of f of x is equal to n times x to the n minus 1. And we know that from our last example. We proved that using induction. We will use this fact and the quotient rule to show that when n is a negative integer, we still get the derivative of f of x is equal to n times x to the n minus 1. I have this note here written down. If f of x is equal to x to the n when n is less than 0, we can consider f of x equals 1 over g of x, where g of x is equal to 1 over f of x, which is equal to x to the minus n. By the quotient rule, the derivative of 1 over g of x is equal to g times the derivative of what's on top minus what's on top times the derivative of what's on bottom, that is g, so the derivative of g, all over g squared. For g, I have x to the minus n times the derivative of 1, which is 0, so this goes to 0, minus 1 times the derivative of g, which is just negative n, x to the this exponent minus 1, which is minus n minus 1, all over g squared, which is x to the minus 2n. The rest is algebra until we finally get that our derivative is equal to n times x to the n minus 1, which is exactly what we wanted. Our next example is the chain rule, where if we have two functions, f going from i to r and g going from j to r, where the image of f, that is f of i, is contained in j, that is the domain of g, and we let c be a point in i, the domain of f, if f is differentiable at c and g is differentiable at f of c, then the composition function g of f, g of f, is differentiable, and the derivative is equal to the derivative of g of f of c times the derivative of f of c. This chain rule is the same chain rule that you know from first year calculus. Our first example, let f of x equal x times sine of 1 over x for x not equal to 0 and f of 0 defined as 0. We're going to use the derivative sine of x is equal to cosine of x to compute the derivative of f at any point not equal to 0. Since we have a function of x multiplied by another function of x, when we take the derivative of f of x, we need to use the product rule. And by the product rule, we get 1 times sine of 1 over x plus x times the derivative of sine over 1 over x. And now we can view sine of 1 over x as a function composition. Our first function is 1 over x, and our second function, g, is sine of f of x. So by the chain rule, we take our outer function, which is sine of x, and take the derivative of it, cosine of 1 over x, and now we need to take the derivative of the inner function, which is 1 over x. So the derivative of 1 over x is minus 1 over x squared, again using the chain rule. So our final answer is sine of 1 over x minus 1 over x, these combining these two, times cosine of 1 over x. A quick review. We've looked at the formal definition of a derivative of a function at a point c, and here is that uh, definition right here. We also saw that the difference of squares and difference of cubes formula and a generalization of it is um, often useful. We looked at sequences and how they can provide another way of determining if f is differentiable at a point. We also looked at the relation between continuity and differentiability. In particular, we saw that differentiability implies continuity, but the converse is not necessarily true. We looked at the rules of derivatives for some products and quotients, as well as the chain rule, which should be familiar from first-year calculus. By way of review, I have these three problems for you to try. Pause the video, give them a try, and on the next slide, I'll have solutions for you. And here are the solutions. 
And that is it for this video. Thank you for watching.